Well, we're back again. Last week, we started a series on the book of Galatians, a book written by Paul to churches in the region of Galatia. And as we've read this book, or as I've read this book over the last several weeks, something that has resonated with me are the questions Paul asks. As he's writing this letter, he asks very specific, very good questions that, that the people who read it are supposed to answer. Last week, we looked at this question. Whose approval are you seeking? Are you seeking the approval of God? Or are you seeking the approval of men? Such a powerful question for us to answer when it comes to our motivation in life. This week, I want to ask a question or, or look at one of Paul's questions that follow that. I mean, once I've answered the question of if I'm seeking the approval of God, the question becomes, how do I obtain the approval of God? Like, what do I do to get his approval? I want his approval. That's what I long for. And so, so the question I ask is, how do I get his approval? If we read Galatians chapter 3, there's Paul asks this same question. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you a spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you've heard? See, Paul's ministry, what happened was he went to this region of Galatia. He preached his gospel of Jesus Christ. In preaching his gospel, he saw people come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Jews and Gentiles responded to his gospel. God called him to go to other regions because he was a missionary. He wanted all to know. And as he's left this region, he's began to hear reports of those who have perverted his gospel. Those who have changed the gospel in which he preached. And Paul responds to this change because now, instead of it just being a gospel that has come by faith, it's a gospel in which some are saying that the Gentiles must follow the law in order to be saved. And Paul is saying, no, that is not what I preached. It's like this analogy. This is maybe an a unfair analogy, but the simplest one I could come up with. We've all received a phone call at some point or an offer at some point for a free maybe uh Three-day, two-night vacation on a beach or, or in the mountains or whatever else. And it sounds good. The pitch sounds good. And so we seek more information. As we begin to seek more information, we find out that we're required to go to like a three-hour sales pitch, trying to convince us to buy something that we didn't need in the first place. And not only are we required, but our spouse is required. And then for us to come, we have to reach, meet certain financial standards in order for us to even be considered for this offer. This offer of a free gift suddenly has so many conditions placed upon it that no one wants to do it. It's that addition. Remember Paul in his letter in the, in the first chapter of Galatians, he says that there are some who have added to my gospel, the gospel in which I preached, preached. And if it's I or angels who add to this gospel, we should be cursed. He was so passionate about the gospel in which he preached that he said anyone who added to it would be cursed. How were they adding to it? Galatians chapter 2 gives us a clue. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be attained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Paul is passionate about the gospel in which he preaches, which reveals a gospel that is not based on the law, but is based on the works of Jesus Christ. It's not based on obedience to the law that, that is written on tablets of stone, but, but the faith that comes as we become empowered by the Spirit of God. What is Paul's gospel? Paul's gospel can be found in the book of Romans. It's, it's Paul's epistle. This is Paul's letter to the churches in Rome. It's a, it's a profound letter of Paul's gospel. Romans 3, 
But now apart from the law, righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Paul's gospel starts with the reality that all have sinned. That's Jew and Gentile. We have all sinned. He says in Romans chapter 6, but now you've been set free from sin and become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's gospel says all have sinned. You and I have sinned. The wages of that sin is death. That's Jew and Gentile. What happens when we sin, it results in death. But he says in Romans chapter 5, you see at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the position. That's the premise of Paul's gospel. There is sin. Every one of us have sinned. Jew and Gentile have sinned. But God has made a provision for each and every one of us. He's demonstrated his love to each and every one of us. That while we were still struggling with this sin problem, he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. So what is our response? How do we seek? How do we gain his approval? In Romans chapter 10, Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend to the deep that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it's with your heart you are believed and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul is saying our salvation is based on confessing with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believing in our heart that God raised him from the dead. He says, then we'll be saved. And, and Paul gets upset. Paul gets aggressive. Paul responds with passion when someone adds to that premise. When someone adds to the gospel that says we must still do the things of the law. No, the law was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We must still practice circumcision or have dietary things in order to be in the kingdom of God. And Paul says, no, that is not anymore. Jesus Christ came for the Jew and for the Gentile that simply by faith and by faith alone, we might have new life in him. We might experience the product of righteousness in us. We might be empowered with the Spirit of God by our faith. That's Paul's gospel. He uses the example of Abraham from the Old Testament, Galatians 3. So Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham believed God. His belief was what was where his righteousness was found. It wasn't in the act of taking his son for the sacrifice. It was the belief in God and the radical obedience that followed. I know there's some what people perceive as, as disunity in Scripture when it comes to the reality of righteousness based on faith or by works. Some say Paul had a position and James had a position and they were, they were in, in, in opposition to each other. If we look at Romans chapter 3, Paul's position, we maintain that a person is justified by faith, faith apart from the works of the law. James's position in James chapter 2, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. 
And we look at those two positions, Paul, which seems to be based on the eyes of God. We maintain a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. James, which some say is, is, is adding to this, that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. But we have to recognize they're coming at different angles. Remember, Paul is writing to the church in Galatia because there are some who are requiring works for salvation. And the requirement for works is hindering the good news of Jesus Christ. The requirement for circumcision is causing issues. The add-ons are causing struggles for those to receive. James's epistle was coming from a different context. He's writing to the scattered church. He's writing to believers who have been scattered and persecuted for their faith. They mostly are Jewish believers. And in writing this, he's very pastoral. And what is he dealing with? He's dealing with people in leadership, people who are manipulating others because of their works. They aren't living the way in which God designed them to live. They're taking people for granted. They're abusing people. They're, they're, they're manipulating people. And James is saying, when you look at them, what do you consider them? The fruit of their life is not salvation. His position is in opposition to Paul's position. I mean, Paul believes in works just as much as James does. In the book of, uh, of Romans, there's a whole chapter that talks about offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. He instructs Titus, in his letter to Titus, he says people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. In the book of Philippians, we must live in a manner worthy of Christ. Paul was about works, but that is the product of our faith. It's not what produces our faith. The product of our salvation is good works. For James, he's dealing with people who are, who are proclaiming salvation, but their works are not in line with. So he says your works for people to consider you to be saved. Your works should be revealing what God has done in you you how do i obtain the approval of god how do i obtain this gift of righteousness that he's offered there is nothing in my efforts that i can do to attain that it comes through the confession and belief it comes through confessing with my mouth jesus christ is lord honoring that he is the one who is in control of it all believing in my heart that jesus christ was raised from the dead and when i confess that with my mouth and when i believe that in my heart i am saved my works follow the lord bless you and keep you may he make his face shine upon you be gracious to you may he turn his face towards you and grant you his peace and may you seek God's approval simply by faith alone, not trying to attain it with your efforts and endeavors. Be blessed.